This video was sponsored by Brilliant, who have kindly reiterated their support to creators uh, during these uncertain times. I filmed this a few weeks ago, and um, hopefully it'll act as a pleasant distraction. There was one segment that I hadn't filmed in time. See if you can spot it. About six years ago, I looked up the most viewed TED Talks when I was bored, and one of them was super short at only three minutes long. Remember when YouTube used to promote short videos? It was Terry Moore's fun video about a better way to tie your shoelaces. If you haven't seen it, the link is below, but basically he explains that most of us, myself included, had been tying the knot wrong. The better way means fewer instances of undone shoelaces. Now, for some reason, this really resonated with me. I was very excited to try out the new technique of shoelace tying, but after a few months, I wasn't really sure it had reduced my bow unbinding mishaps, or bums. This is medicine after all, everything needs a three-letter acronym. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't tend to have that many bums. So it was hard to really gauge if the new knot had made any difference. So I did what any good scientist would have done, an experiment. For the last six years, I've been cataloguing every instance my shoelaces came undone. Well, six and a half years, actually. And I'm now ready to present my findings. I think I must have been inspired by fellow Dr. Donald Unger, who cracked his knuckles on just one side for 60 years to test if it actually caused any problems. He found that cracking joints has no effect, neither positive nor negative. Bad news, chiropractors. But before I present my findings, let's consider how a trial is structured. Now, the first distinction is observational versus treatment trials. Observational first. The crappiest form is the case series, a favorite of pseudoscientific practices, but found everywhere. They collect a bunch of people who report a benefit from some ineffective therapy like homeopathy, chiropractic, juice cleansing, or a fancy looking gizmo on QVC, and say, this proves that the therapy works. No, it doesn't, it proves nothing. It sits at the bottom of the pyramid of evidence, which is not always the most useful model. You can have very bad examples of trials at the top and good examples of middling ones, but I think we can all agree that case reports belong at the bottom. Now, the next rung up is a case control study. That would mean if I went into the building here and found 100 people who have had an undone shoelace in the last month or whatever time frame, then we find people who haven't had an untied shoelace, then we ask each group how they tie their shoelaces. It starts with the outcome we're interested in and then finds out about the intervention we're interested in. A less silly example would be I find a hundred diabetics and a hundred non-diabetics and I ask how, how often they go running. If the diabetics report going running less often than non-diabetics, it's tempting to say that's the cause of their diabetes, a lack of exercise. But you can't establish causality from an observational study. For example, the diabetics might have foot problems, causing them to go running less. A cross-sectional study is similar, but it's a snapshot of a population at a single point in time. So perhaps me going to the park outside and asking everybody about their shoelaces and their bum activity. These are the form that most dietary trials take. As mentioned, you can't establish whether X causes Y, and they tend to be susceptible to all kinds of bias, such as recall bias. The advantages are they're quick to perform, they're cheap, they're easy, and nutrition science is filled with these pointless and badly designed trials. A prospective cohort study takes more time but can yield better results. This is where a group doing a certain thing, for example, a vegetarian diet, vaping, yoga, whatever, is followed up over time and compared with a control group that do not do that thing. Or it could be, say, comparing people with arthritis to people without arthritis. Over time, one looks for differences between the groups. So I could find everybody who ties their shoes the better way and compare them with people who tie their shoes the conventional method and prospectively, i.e. forwards in time, gather information about how many bums they have. A weakness is that for something like a bum, or let's say something slightly more important like a stroke, these are quite rare things to happen for any given person, so you need large numbers of patients and a long period of follow-up to get decent numbers. I decided to perform the gold standard of clinical trial, which isn't perfect, by the way. You can still game the system, but a randomized control trial. This is because I am prospectively, again, going forward in time, testing out an intervention. And I'm not just observing what's happening, I'm actually affecting it. This is a treatment trial, not observational. I randomized one of my feet to be the intervention arm. 
of the study, and the other foot to be the control arm. And that's probably a sentence that's never been said before. From then on, I tied my left shoe with the new method and my right with the old, and I logged every bum that I had. But wait, I hear you say, perhaps there is something inherently weird about one of my feet. Perhaps I bop like I study dentistry and I think I'm a gangster. Fair point. So at the end of the first year, I swapped sides. Now this is called a crossover study where both arms, feet, experience both options, like a placebo and an intervention. And then I repeated this crossover every year since. Now the best medical trials are triple-blinded, meaning that the patient, the experimenter, and the statistician don't know whether the intervention or the placebo are being tested. As in this case, I am or all three of those things, I didn't feel it was possible to achieve this without hiring a full-time shoelace administrator, and I'd already blown my entire budget on someone to put on my socks. I'll quickly mention the other types of study that you'll see in the pyramid. If I took all the literature on spontaneous shoelace undoing and wrote a summary, that would be a systematic review. If I took the actual data from all the available studies, combined them to form one large data set, analyze that and publish the findings, that would be a meta-analysis. So what are the results? Well, in about six and a half years, I experienced BUM 149 times. Does that sound like a lot? I don't really know. We've been having very warm summers in London in recent years. I can't think why. And I'm a big fan of sandals. I like to unleash my feet on the world in the hot weather. I also wear theater clogs most of the time at work. The new technique caused 70 bums and the old technique, 79. The new TED technique resulted in fewer bums overall, but this is not a statistically significant result. It could be achieved about 20% of the time just due to chance. If I was devious, I could just show you year six, where the new technique really outperformed the old one. But this is misleading when considered with the whole data set. I'm now about as fast tying shoelaces with either technique, and I have to admit that the new technique does look nicer as it sits horizontal on the shoe rather than vertical, but I can't recommend that you adopt the new technique, which will involve a learning curve where your shoelace tying time will increase and you'll waste at least a few seconds per year on the claim that it results in your shoelaces being untied less often because the statistics in an admittedly extremely small sample size do not back that up. Now you think that this is way over the top just to decide which method to use to do up your shoes and you're right. But neither shoelace technique has harmful side effects. Neither is claiming to treat an illness. If you're being sold or prescribed something that will go inside your body or purports to heal what ails you, you must insist on an even better level of evidence than this, because this was only tested on two subjects, my feet. Now, at least they belong to a human. Often I'll see breathless promotion of some wacky treatment from often Silicon Valley type believers, which has only been tested on mice. Whether it's from goop, a chiropractor, a shaman, or a medically qualified doctor, don't be afraid to ask, what is the evidence for this? If they give you a bunch of anecdotes, you know that this isn't a proven therapy. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. You're responsible for your own decisions. But just know where you stand, metaphorically or literally. This is part of my If It Ducks Like a Quack series, which focuses on critical thinking in medicine, how to cut through the BS and not only identify lies in alternative medicine, but in conventional medicine as well. I still consider myself a total beginner in terms of logic and critical thinking skills, and the best way to build that up is with regular practice, not just passively watching clowns on the internet like me. The sponsors that made this video possible are brilliant, who offer loads of courses in science and maths, including probability, chance, logic, reasoning, all of which will arm you to make better decisions about not just your health, but beyond. We can all spare five minutes a day, so instead of scrolling through the gram on the train, I try the daily challenges. Ah, chemistry, nice, a bit more familiar territory. So we need to calculate how much nitrogen is needed to use 30 kilograms of hydrogen. So if we look at this reaction, then the atomic mass is one, so that's six, and this is 14, so that's 28. So 28 is four and two thirds bigger than six. So then 30 kilograms of hydrogen times that by four and two thirds will be 140. So subtract that is 70 kilograms. Let's try it out. 
Yes, nice, good. What about springs? Ah, oh, okay, I think I know mechanics. Which springboard will compress more? Um, wrong. And you see, after each question, you get a discussion with other users and an ex explanation of where you went wrong or went right. So if you find the videos I make useful, please go and visit brilliant.org slash medlife where you can sign up for free. However, if you decide to go for the premium package, the first 200 visitors using my link will get 20% off the annual fee. So you can spend less time scrolling through social media and more time expanding that brain.